you are the last survivor and you are qualified for the next session. Thank you, Bert. Okay, this session is about uh, verification. And we've been talking a lot about verification, but there is an important point. We would all love to have a not fake news or certified news, but what should we do? Should we verify the journalist? Should we verify the article? Should we verify the media? It's very complicated to decide who would be a legacy media or a true media, a certified media, and who would not be. So. This is the topic of our panel today, and uh, Richard Addis will introduce his panel. Thank you so much, please. Hello, everybody. Is that working? How are you all? Good to see you. Um, I, firstly, I have a little story. It's actually a confession, uh, quite a bad confession. Um, it goes like this. When I left university, and told the careers office that I wanted to be a journalist, I didn't tell them that I wanted to write fiction. So when I got an interview to be deputy editor of a careers magazine, I said in the interview that I was related to Alexander the Great. That was a big lie, but it made someone laugh, and I got the job. That was in 1980, and I think maybe everyone was crazy then. The owners of the title wanted to cut costs, so I offered to write all the content myself. The normal content was interviews with people about the jobs they did. I found there wasn't really time to go out and interview people, as well as writing all the articles. So I wrote all the articles without interviewing anybody. And they turned out OK. I wrote an article about driving a milk lorry, delivering door to door the daily routine, the hard bits of the job, the fun bits of the job. And I got a call from the UK Milk Marketing Board. Uh-oh. I thought, I'm going to lose my job. Actually, they said they wanted to buy the article to use in their staff magazine because it was so good and so accurate, which they did. To this day, nobody has ever spotted the fiction until now. Here I am, 40 years later, I confess. It was entirely fake news. So today, I'm definitely the prodigal son, or maybe poacher termed gamekeeper. I now run a business called The Day that turns daily news into lessons for children. Most of the entire purpose of the business is to teach children how to know what is true. I just have three things to say about verification. One, the first is, if you tell it well and honestly, the truth is far more interesting than anything you can make up. Second, essentially what makes us human is our ability to collaborate, empathize, socialize, and live and work together. And we can't do that unless we agree on an idea of truth. Lies on the converse drive us apart, polarize, trigger wars, and spread hatred. And the third thing is, truth is a complex and slippery fish. You can't pin it down to just being facts. There is truth in humor, polemic, imagery, feeling. And if we jump in and define it too narrowly, our efforts will probably fail. Now, we have three fine speakers here. Uh, and this will be very interesting because we all have very different angles on the subject. For myself, I believe that education is the answer, the immunization that society needs. Education is everything. Critical thinkers, after all, don't fall for propaganda or believe lies. They tend not to support Donald Trump or vote for Brexit. That's all proven. Paul here of Newswhip believes that fake news may not be the main problem. He will tell us the real problem might be fake polemic, which is much harder to deal with. For Olga here from Kiev, fake news is not a debate. It's a matter of life and death. And every day she sees that firsthand. And for Scott, you can immunize the internet, he says. You really can by certifying trustworthy publishers. Now, later, we're going to have questions from the floor. 
So do start thinking of what you uh, want to ask. And I'm going to ask each of the speakers now to summarize their ideas. Paul is going to start by showing us some slides, then Olga, and then Scott, and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction, and I think, I guess everyone is stunned into silence at the surprise confession there, Richard, that you're behind it all. Lock him up. Lock him up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Paul Quigley. I'm the CEO at Newswith. Um, I'm also known as the Irish guy with the accent you can actually understand. Um, I've been called that a couple of times at the, at the conference, so I might put that on my business card. Um, good, we're up. Um, and you haven't wandered into a philosophy class. We'll have quite a grounded discussion on this, but I want to talk about verification, the co context of maintaining common reality and, and quality content. Um, very briefly, Newswhip monitors engagement with content. And as new stories are published, we predict which ones are going to become big based on social signals, mainly engagement on Facebook and Twitter. And by doing that in real time, we can kind of give newsrooms a, a preview of what are going to be the big stories today. And what's, what happens when you do that is you build up a huge data set. We, we pull in millions of articles every day, millions of Facebook posts, and then you can analyze that data set and you can see what kind of content is getting engagement. You can look at the quality and see big ecosystem things happening over time. Um, and what I want to argue is that there's a real quality problem, but it isn't just around fake, actual false news. It's around um, highly biased news, and partisan news, and twisting facts to present agendas. But first, fake news was a very big problem. If we go back to 2016, by our metrics, of the top 200 most engaged with stories in the three months prior to the November election, um, fully 40% of them were either fake or extremely biased to the point of being, being meaninglessly misleading, uh, such as Pope Francis's famous endorsement of Donald Trump, which of course did not happen. Now in the immediate aftermath of the election, um, there was a very strong industry response. Uh, we got involved early with First Draft and uh, which I think is an organization everyone is familiar with. Um, there was a really strong response in all of the different markets. We've got what Scott is doing with content certification. We've got stopping fakes and debunking. And these initiatives have been quite effective. Also because Facebook eventually uh, took this on as a serious problem and started de-boosting and punishing the bad websites and the bad actors. So when you fast forward to today, this is just to indicate how hard it is for fake news merchants. This is a screenshot I took on Tuesday of our platform Spike. And you can't make out all of the names there, but these are new, NewsHound, NewsExaminer, YourNewsWire.com, uh, websites that would have gotten huge traction back in 2016 and 2017 before Facebook started punishing them. And of all of the output of all of these sites, the most engaged with stories got about 300 Facebook interactions, which is not very much. On the same day, at the same time, a screenshot of the biggest US news, uh, stories are getting uh, north of 150,000 uh, interactions. So the problem is being, is being crushed. And when there is a big high profile fake, like the Bronx uh, conservative blogger who slowed down a video of Nancy Pelosi and adjusted the audio so she'd appear drunk, it gets so thoroughly debunked. Uh, thousands of, of articles have been written um, debunking that story. So, the, the what, 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 when we sorry, so the, this we, we see that there is this problem is being addressed quite effectively. It needs to be continually addressed. Meanwhile, what are people engaging with? Um, at the end of March, these were the most engaged with stories on on Facebook, um, and they're a real mixed bag of 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 pretty awful. About half of these are culture war stories. The bottom there is Fox News, Dems to strike, so help me God, from, from an oath. Um, we've got a, what's essentially fake news, Momo Challenge is hacking Peppa Pig Fortnite and YouTube Kids warns school. So I'm sure the editors at the Mirror knew that the Momo Challenge wasn't real, but they got, this is Facebook shares, not just interactions, over, over a quarter of a million uh, shares on that story. There's and the most engaged with story, which is so strange, suspected human trafficker, child predator, may be in your area. A perfect headline for a viral scare 
to move around. In fact, that area was Waco, Texas, and it was published by a small local news site, US 105 FM, their local radio st station, and this became the biggest news story in the world by volume of, of shares by, by March of this year. And it essentially became fake news quickly, because the guy was captured within hours. But then this story is going around the web for, for days afterwards, and everyone thinks there's a predator in their area. So while the facts in that story were intrinsically true, it was a very misleading narrative. And people are spitting into two different worlds. Any t I sometimes open up Fox to see how they're treating the latest Donald Trump-type slip-up or mistake, and they just aren't covering it. They're writing about something ridiculous the Democrats did. Um, there's com are entirely different facts being selected by, by the right and left, and we mirror it in Europe with our conservative nationalist-oriented media and our internationalist liberal-oriented media, and people are just living in different realities. So I'd say all-out fake is a big problem, but currently, through all of the initiatives that are underway, it's under control. But partisan and fear-mongering as, as the biggest content in the news is just continuing as, as a massive problem, and we don't seem to have a way to address that. Um, like, we report facts. Here's a picture of a rioter breaking a window in Westminster in 2010 during a protest, so we can show that image, or we can zoom out and we can see that that's not really represent representative of what's happening at the protest. Um, and in fact, all the photographers want to get that nice, that nice controversial moment. So, um, you know, to wrap up, I think media needs in internal verification, but we need to improve the context of news and complexify stories so they're not just pointing a finger at the other guys, which is increasingly the content that's getting engagement. And I think if we can do that, we can figure out ways of pushing the big platforms, especially Facebook and Twitter, to reward that kind of quality content in their algorithms and in their, in their search results. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of my two cents. I'm sorry to monopolize the first few minutes there, Richard, but... No, no, that's really great. Great pictures, great pictures. It's wonderful to see some, some of those pictures. Um, now, Olga, you're going to talk to us. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, let me tell you about our Stop Fake project. This project was created four, five years ago uh, on 2nd March. Um, I remember that Sunday evening well. Uh, that, um, a few days ago, uh, unmarked soldiers entered Crimean Peninsula. Obviously, they, have, uh, they had um, green military uniforms and uh, they didn't, um, I don't know, they didn't uh, say anything. And uh, obviously, they were Russian soldiers, but Russia did not confirm this. And um, at the same time, a lot of false news about Ukraine appeared in uh, the information uh, space. And uh, we, as um, uh, responsible journalists, were shocked with scale of this uh, lies, because um, it was outrage lies about Ukraine. And so we, um, uh, me with my colleagues, journalists, created, decided to create a website to investigate this fake news. Um, the idea was to collect all uh, fake items on our uh, website. Um, firstly, we uh, check different suspicious pieces of news. Then, if it turns out to be fake, we put it on our website. If it's not a fake, we do nothing. Uh, it was easy to be done and did not require money. So, Calix immediately supported my idea. And uh, we created this website in one hour. In the next hour, uh, the little article about um, this website uh, was reposted about 30 13 thousand uh, times so it uh, I think it uh, man meant that um, people were hungry for such information so um, we immediately became a very uh, well-known uh, project and um, I hoped that uh, we um, I don't know in one or three months we uh, regained um, Crimea, and uh, we would regain Crimea, and we, uh, we would close our project. But unfortunately, 
Since then, a lot of different events happened. Uh, we have, now we have uh, Russian aggression in uh, eastern Ukraine. Now we uh, faced any, um, a lot of different challenges, like uh, a crash of Malaysian airline jumbo jet um, on, uh, above Donbass, and uh, the, um, I don't know, some, uh, and, and a, lo a lot of killed people. And uh, at the same time, we had uh, some positive news, like visa-free regime with the EU, like uh, some positive uh, steps on, uh, on the path of reforms and so on. And all these events were presented by Russian media uh, to their audiences in a distorted light and were twisted. So we had a lot of work all this time. And um, uh, now, uh, uh, initially we had only two uh, languages on our website, English and Russian, because a lot of fake news are uh, promoted in these languages. Now we have 13 language versions. We have, yes, we, <laughs> we have checked uh, more than 10,000 uh, different photos, videos, uh, news uh, items, and we debunked uh, more than 3,000 fake news. And we collected all of them on our website. We um, have like an archive of them. And we use this to um, increase media literacy of our readers. We have um, 200,000 uh, followers in social media. And uh, at the same time, we use this to um, uh, do research about this phenomena. And, we, and, and now we um, uh, an, uh, anal analyze it, um, um, this, our items of fake news, and we identified 18 narratives created using this fake news. Uh, for example, that Ukraine is a fascist state, that Ukraine is a failed state, that Ukraine is a state run by a junta who came to power as a result of a coup d'etat, uh, and so on. And, um, uh, and of course, uh, that uh, Russia is not a part of war in Ukraine. Uh, and um, uh, it, uh, it mean, uh, means that um, it's not a bad journalism. It's, it's not a sloppy journalism. It's an, an intentional um, uh, disinformation, it's intentional act of disinformation. So, um, uh, so uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, verification is not, a only, on, not the only solution for this problem because uh, it's, uh, this fake news is just a part of a uh, bigger picture, of bigger propaganda ecosystem. And this propaganda ecosystem is, uh, contains not only journalists, but also uh, we focus on journalists' works. Uh, work because the journalists are our colleagues uh, and we try to uh, improve this environment. But uh, this uh, disinformation machine contains uh, also corrupted politicians, uh, non-corrupted politicians uh, who uh, sincerely believe in these ideas, uh, so-called useful idiots. Um, uh, Russian funded media abroad uh, like uh, like Sputnik, for example, it's a part of uh, disinformation campaign uh, of this disinformation machine. It's proven because they also sometimes uh, uh, promote, uh, sometimes they also disseminate a uh, fake news. Um, and it's not only about fake news; it's also about promote uh, promotion of uh, these narratives. Um, and uh, the, the, mm, uh, this media and this system. Uh, do something every t every day, or th um, something. Uh, sometimes it's every um, week. Sometimes every day. But that they all the time they try to um, make to to hold these um, narratives alive in informational space. Uh, to uh, yes, to uh, <laughs> to put some uh, fake news stories. To put some uh, I don't know some speeches maybe some. Uh, TV shows, some films, and so on and so forth. So um, I think that, um, and, and it's uh, pretty descriptive to, uh, not only to, um, uh, 
to, to talk about Russian propaganda. It's, uh, Russian prop uh, Russia is like a pioneer in this sphere, but uh, a lot of countries uh, um, now face the same problem. Um, for example, EU, for example, US, uh, EU countries, um, for example, the, uh, uh, let me just um, uh, call one uh, such narrative. Uh, one of the most popular propaganda narrative and fa false news narrative um, is um, Armageddon due to migration. And so if the, um, we have this problem all over the world. How come that it's possible? Uh, because social media made it possible because when we see something interesting in social media, we just click and pass it along. And, um, um, but the problem is that we make our decisions on the news we have, uh, we get from the social media and from the press. And so the decision, when, decision, uh, when news are false, decisions are wrong. And it's a threat for democracy and a threat for our society. And the solution is not only in ver is, is verification. It's not only about verification. I think it's like, um, I don't know, set of, uh, set of different um, measures. Verification, education. Education is a long term. Uh, solution, I think. It's a, like a strategy. Policy regulation. We um, uh, defined one of our uh, audiences uh, as uh, policy makers in different countries. And I think that the main, what is the main, um, uh, I don't know, what is the main need is the creation of, of the new, um, uh, new, maybe new ecosystem, ecosystem of trust. I don't know, I'm not, I have no idea how, uh, how to do this, but I think that it's uh, the most important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. You, um, I think we have a very brave person here. Um, but before going further, let's talk to Scott. I want to keep talking to Olga. Uh, this is, uh, I, I, I have to say, I met Olga first, a, a, almost exactly a year ago, at uh, the Miss Infocon in Kiev. And you know, uh, like a typical American, the amount that I didn't know about some of the dynamics of international uh, politics, especially the story about the green men, uh, that was an example for me of misinformation that literally is killing people, uh, you know, leading to the deaths of real people in, in uh, Eastern Ukraine. And, um, and, and we were there at this amazing time because it was in Kiev the day that, uh, you may remember the story of Ar Arkady, uh, Arkady Babchenko, who was the Russian journalist who was in Kiev, who apparently was killed by the Russians and then uh, showed up the next day at his own press conference about his death and it turns out he had faked his own death somehow as part of a plot to try to capture the blah, blah, blah. There, I, I wrote a long blog post about it if you want to look it up on the MissInfoCon website about Kiev. And it was so striking to me because this all happened right while we were in Kiev. And the funny part was that uh, he was still dead when I left Kiev. And then I came here, it came to Jen in Lisbon. And uh, by the time I got to Lisbon, he was alive again. And so it was, uh, it, it was, you know, like all of these things, all of these convergence of, uh, of the misinformation world. Uh, I won't, I won't take a lot of time talking about uh, Certified Content Coalition, just to say that uh, we have never had actual standards in journalism before. We have a lot of great organizations that have really great standards systems for themselves, but we've never had a standard in the way that standards are thought of in literally every other industry. Water, tables, chairs, stages, speakers, they all have standards bodies and they're organized under the International Standards Organization. You've heard of ISO. And uh, the Journalism Trust Initiative being run by Reporters Without Borders, uh, Reporters Sans Frontières, rsf.org. This is the first time that we're gonna have actual standards in journalism. And the ramifications of that, I think, are gonna be huge because we will now have a tool that we haven't had before to be able to do verification at the level of the person that's doing the publication, not an individual journalist, not an individual piece of content, but just to know that somebody is uh, legitimately a publisher 
And that may not sound like very much, but we've never had that before. Like, like there's a lot of great things that we could do with verification, using technology, using lots of different tools, but just to get to a place where we know who's legitimate, who's not, and then be able to have that be a signal that we can provide to the platforms, have that be something that advertisers can use, because they've been talking a big game about trying to demonetize misinformation, but we haven't seen a lot of real strong evidence that they actually are doing anything. And part of the problem is they haven't had a tool to do that. And so I think that Journalism Trust Initiative is that kind of tool that's gonna be able to provide that verification. So happy to get into the conversation and... and, and yes. Well, I mean, that's absolutely great. I just thought we should just, between us, touch on the um, question of the title of the talk about whether whether we should really, when it comes to verification, should we really focus on the title or the journalist or get right down to the article um, and do it article by article? And I wonder what anybody thinks on the panel. I mean, I mean it's all of the above, right? Like, like uh, there's lots of, uh, you know, there are lots of sort of, I call them black boxes, right? There are lots of people that come up with some proposal that you stick a piece of content into a black box and it'll pop up and tell you whether it's true or not. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of pitches on lots of those kinds of things. I haven't seen one that has totally won me over yet, uh, but I think that could be a useful tool for journalists. Uh, I think that could be a useful tool in the system. Do, do you think uh, individual re reporters could have, um, could be sort of uh, qualified or given some kind of uh, badge that meant you could trust their work? My, my personal feeling about badges is, you know, I'm old enough to remember some of the, the badges on the internet. Remember the e-trust thing that people would put on? And uh, it's, you know, my, my teenager at home could go and figure out how to copy that and put it on a site to, uh, to uh, for whatever. So the, the trick for me is not what's public facing, but what's being done in the background. Um, and, and also to get into the level of individual journalists, I, I'm, I'm not there yet. I, I, I think it needs to be at the publication level. I wonder in um, Ukraine if there are particular journalists or titles that you totally trust. Uh, yes, it's not so many uh, because unfortunately uh, most of Ukrainians, Ukrainian media are owned by oligarchs, by rich people who um, promote their um, agenda through this media. It's a um, uh, it's the uh, biggest TV channels with the biggest audience. Uh, we have uh, sm more small, smaller um, outlets who really uh, report truth, who are really deserve trust. And um, and so some of my colleagues from these outlets are here. For for example, Romatsky TV. But unfortunately, that they have a small audience, and yep. the problem is to uh, to rise this audience. Like, w when you look at, um, like the most uh, the most engaged with publishers in the world currently, uh, uh, publisher in the world is Fox News. So, um, will they participate in the in the badging of, of journalists? They might, they might not. They certainly need to maintain good editorial standards within Fox News while still driving an agenda that's deeply unpopular, probably with most of the people here. So, that won't solve the the wider problem of uh, people having attitudes first and caring about facts second. One of our challenges must be that the more context and uh, deep reporting and balance that you give to your, to your content, uh, the more it becomes elitist, and the, the more difficult it is to get big, big audiences. Um, yeah, I, uh, well, I think we look at some of the most shared content you do see when you delve in fact, it's the very top cream of it. When you go further down, you do see significant engagement with long form and important media. So that does happen. But the, the algorithms can influence that a lot. Uh, you know, Google is providing a huge amount of traffic to publishers currently. Um, you know, imagine if it was looking at what are the most nuanced and balanced uh, reporting on, on, on this set of facts that add a lot of context to it instead of just, you, you know, and, and they, they would favor good publishers generally, but could that go a layer deeper? And similarly with Facebook, part of the reason why all that crazy stuff was the most shared is because 
Facebook adjusted their algorithm in 2017 or 2018 to favor local news um, and uh, news generally. They wanted to support publishers. The problem is they define news as stories about crime, tragedy, and politics. So that's what we got. And if you look at that, those most shared stories, so the algorithms will influence by the things that appear in newsfeed, how much they get spread. So if that was adjusted for really high quality content, that's going to reward the creators of that as well. So the, they can kind of be kingmakers in, 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 in moving on quality, I think. I've got to ask Olga something too, which is that you're um, exposing, calling out titles owned by powerful oligarchs and Russians, uh, companies. Isn't it dangerous? Yes. Okay. Well, your organization. Um, we, uh, uh, as an organization, we are focused on Russian propaganda, and we are based in Ukraine, fortunately. And I, uh, I hope that it's not. Uh, we, we get some um, threats on uh, online through Facebook, for example, through mail, email. But I don't take it seriously. Um, I think I have to do, uh, to don't take it seriously, so. <laughs> um, yes, that's it. Very brave. Um, we should, we should uh, ask people for questions, and we've got a few minutes for that. Uh, and I'm wondering if anyone on the panel can see a hand going up, because I can't <laughs> see anything. It's, ca it's <laughs> kind of hard to see, but uh, um, oh, there's, thank oh, yes. you for the house lights. Now I can see. Um, so, see if there's any questions coming. Don't see any right now. No. I'll, I'll take a question. Hey, right here. Oh, great. Yeah, we yep. see you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, it's more of a chicken and egg question about when you, the standards, um, should readers want the, the standards? Should the advertisers want the standards? At what point is the motivation of actually turning to standards, where, where do you think it's going to come from, and wh wh where will be that sort of tipping point, where publishers will, will want to embrace standards? I, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, the general consumer experience of standards is uh, to not pay attention to them a at all, right? When when I when I buy a bottle of water, I just know that there's some body out there that has made a decision that there's not going to be arsenic in the drinking water. There's a lot of talk about nutrition labels for news, and, and they may have their place, they may not, but there's no nutrition label for arsenic. And so I just need to count on the fact that there's some boring room somewhere with a l bunch of people doing the boring hard work of figuring out what's the equivalent of, of keeping the arsenic out of the news stream uh, when, it, when it comes to the news publications. Now, whether or not that gets touted, you know, various products use labeling of standards to various degrees, uh, and, and sometimes that's helpful for the marketing, whatever. If that happens, that's terrific, but the most important thing is the process that underlies it, because it's, you know, right now we have a system where uh, we have standards for the news that gets shared around the world, but it is controlled in a dark room, basically, uh, you know, in Menlo Park or uh, in, in Mountain View, California, and, and those people are not accountable to anybody. Now, they're trying very hard, but they are not transparent, really, at all. And so I, I think the idea behind the Journalism Trust Initiative, and I think Christoph will be talking about this a little bit more in the next session, but, but I think the idea is who gets to decide what is part of the standards and the, there's, like, we have a process for doing that, and it's called the ISO process that is very inclusive, that l brings in lots of different opinions, and is a legitimate answer to the question of who gets to decide who is a, who is a legitimate publisher and who is not. Thank you for that question. Um, any more questions? Oh, yes. <coughs> Hi, uh, Nikki Simpson from the International Magazine Center. Um, there was a guy on, on Thursday um, from Deep News Digest who said he was using AI to prove that um, news journalism is trustworthy and that the articles are high quality. Did you see his talk? And if so, what do you think of what he said? Uh, are you uh, talking about Frederick? That's Frederick Pellou. Yeah. 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 
I, I, I thought it was it was very interesting. It's a black box that uh, it's a it's a deep learning um, system that's been trained on good quality journalism. I don't know how it was. Some humans would have sat in the room and said, "This is good stuff. This is bad stuff," and it got good at recognizing the good stuff. After they stripped out all the entities, so it must have been about the sentence structure and some other dimensions, but we can't tell what it is because it's in a black box. Um, it is not verifying facts. I think it was about quality. Yeah. But you could write a very high quality little piece as you did about the milk round, and it might get a five out of five from, from yeah, if you really, well, you'd need to write a counter algorithm to optimize for, for his algorithm. You, I, I uh, spent a long time talking to Frederick, yeah. uh, and I understand that he has some very smart engineers creating the algorithm, but they have to speak to him every day, and he's a journalist at heart, and he was a journalist, so he thinks what's good about his algorithm is that it's really being created from journalistic first principles, um, and he's adding to it every day. So the idea, I think you will know this, the idea is that ultimately the best journalism rises to the top and that publishers can then charge more to advertisers to set their ads against that journalism, thereby funding more good journalism. So creating a virtuous cycle. I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, it's still very small. It, and, and incredibly tricky, the, there's a group called the Credibility Coalition that's been looking at this and they've been doing some research. One of the things that intrigued me the most was uh, the sensationalism of the headline was a negative indicator for the, the trustworthiness of the article in news, but it was a positive indicator for the trustworthiness of the story if it was from the world of sports. <laughs> so the kinds of things that are tricky even in English, even in one language, are super difficult, so. I think that um, that is a signal to us. <laughs> are we Your being, arrival. We came in with the Greek dance. I are we, we being have, taken uh, out with the Greek dance also? Three, two, one, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.